Welcome to the Clued in Mystery Podcast. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brooke. And we both love mystery. Brooke, I'm super excited to be talking about Wilkie Collins today. I loved learning about this guy. This was somebody who has always been on the radar, but I didn't know a lot about. And I was very surprised and am really looking forward to hearing what you have to say today, Sarah. Yeah, I, I am looking forward to comparing notes with you because, uh, yeah, I didn't know very much about him before we started um, or before I started researching for, for this episode and uh, just a really fascinating person. Definitely. So I'll start with a quick bio and, and um, then we can, yeah, chat about his, his writing and his life. William Wilkie Collins was born in 1824 and died in 1889. During those 65 years, he had quite a life. His father was William Collins, who was an accomplished landscape artist and a member of the Royal Academy. His father was also conservative and religious, and that influence, or perhaps a rejection of it, can be credited with what would be considered an unorthodox lifestyle in Victorian London. Rather than marrying, Wilkie lived with two women, dividing his time between them. He began his relationship with Carolyn Graves in 1858, and it continued until he died. He met Martha Rudd around 1864, and in 1868, she moved within walking distance of the house that he shared with Carolyn Graves. Martha and Wilkie had three children, and they used Dawson as their surname because the couple went by William and Martha Dawson, likely to lend their relationship some respectability. Carolyn Graves actually married another man in 1868, but that relationship only lasted a couple of years before she returned to Wilkie, and both women outlived him. Wilkie's health was not great, and he was a heavy user of opium, or laudanum, due to pain that he suffered from gout. He traveled extensively seeking cures for his ailments. He was also very well educated, and while he was at boarding school, it was another student bullying him into telling him stories nightly that ignited his passion for writing. He ultimately studied law at Lincoln's Inn and was called to the bar in 1851, but never actually practiced law. By then, he'd already published several stories and a novel, and uh, around that time, he began working with Charles Dickens, with whom he formed a very close relationship, and they worked together on plays and other creative works. He continued writing. Four of his novels, including The Woman in White and, Mo and The Moonstone, were published in the 1860s, and it was those that brought him the most fame. The Woman in White was so popular that merchandise, including clothing, perfume, and music, were named after it. As with many of the authors that we've looked at, he was very prolific, publishing at least 25 novels, more than 50 short stories, and uh, at least 15 plays, and more than 100 nonfiction pieces, though I actually found higher numbers um, for the novels and short stories in um, a couple of sources, so I'm not sure what the actual total was. The Moonstone, which was published in 1868, is considered to be the first modern English detective novel. And The Woman in White is regarded as um, a sensation novel, which uh, I think is a precursor to psychological or domestic thrillers, because the plots involved um, you know, conspiracies and, and secrets. By 1870, he was, according to one source that I found, the most famous writer of English fiction. Interestingly, the first novel that he wrote was only published in 1999, so 110 years after he died. Researchers believed that the novel, which was called Ailani, or Tahiti as it was, a romance, existed based on references in, in Wilkie's letters, uh, but no evidence was found of it when, when he died. Although subsequently, researchers traced it from a playwright who had worked with Collins to, dra to dramatize his stories and novels. After the playwright's death in 1899, the manuscript was auctioned in 1900 and 1903, and then held in a private collection until 1991, when it was made available for auction again and published in 1999. The full text is available online, and we will put a link to that in the show notes. So yeah, that's just a, a brief summary of, of his life, but um, I think there's lots that we can unpack there and, and lots that I want to discuss about him. Oh my gosh, yes. So that was Excellent. Uh, excellent little bio, uh, Sarah. I, I learned a few things that even I didn't discover in my research. I thought that it was really interesting. There's a few points that I discovered in learning about him that things that we think of as modern, either modern issues or modern topics, uh, 
came up in his life. And I learned another one. He had merch. You know, we think of that as kind of this modern day thing for authors, but he had merch and I did not know that. That's exciting and very cool. And then the other point of having that novel come out 110 years after his death, that that's just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, the, the merchandise thing is, uh, I thought that was really interesting. I don't, I didn't see if he licensed it or, you know, if, mm-hmm. if he benefited from, from its sale. Um, but the fact that, you know, people, he was, he was so popular at the time. I read about the close relationship that he had with Charles Dickens. I think uh, I got the sense that he was at the time more popular than, um, than Dickens was, but for whatever reason, I think Dickens, his popularity has endured. Whereas like, I don't know that Wilkie Collins is, he's certainly not a household name now. And I imagine it's, it's really people who are kind of scholars in the mystery genre who, who are really familiar with him. Uh, cause I wasn't actually familiar with him before we, before we started looking into him. Yeah, exactly. It, you're right. Charles Dickens is the enduring name that we recognize, but they were definitely, um, colleagues at the time did a lot of work together and then also were just friends, uh, you know, had spent a lot of time together. And, um, I thought it, it, I was shocked because in a sense he was, Wilkie Collins was so famous at this point in time. Um, he kind of had, he was like the rock star of the 1860s literary scene. He, you know, he had the women and the drugs and ran around with famous people and um, very rebellious as far as his family uh, felt, you know, was living this very uh, unorthodox, like you say, lifestyle. Um, he was like a rock star. Totally. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, like you say, he and Dickens were, um, were colleagues and the women in white and, um, the Moonstone were uh, both serialized in Dickens Mm -hmm. magazine. So, um, Dickens founded this magazine all the year round initially to promote his own work. And, um, I think a tale of two cities and a couple of his other works he serialized in in that magazine, but then also works of of other authors and and um, including Wilkie Collins. Uh, and then I think they, you know, collaborated on on stories, uh, you know, the Christmas editions of of um, this magazine. Um, but there's a lot of reference to how uh, how close that that relationship was. Definitely. And that brings up one of those points that I was thinking of that we think of as a modern situation that clearly is not at all because both Dickens and Wilkie Collins, they kind of utilized their creative work in as many different formats as they could. They serialized their stories, that which came out in Dickens' publications. Then they would create book editions of them when the story was complete. And then many times they would have a stage adaptation. So they were similarly to what authors do these days where we want the ebook format, the print format, an audio book, and then fingers crossed, you know, some film network comes along and you could sell some film rights. I mean, this was happening clear back in the 1850s and 60s. So certainly nothing that we've come up with in modern times. Yeah, I, th- I thought that was really interesting as well. And then uh, I also thought it was interesting that Dickens started this magazine to, to publish himself, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea of, of authors indie publishing isn't new either. Definitely. Another point of the not modern issue is the issue that he had with privacy because he was such a famous person and people were interested in his life that he tried his best to keep his private life private, which was probably important to him considering the very strange living arrangement that he had. And I was wondering, Sarah, in your research, if did the two women know about each other? I mean, they lived literally on the same block. So I'm assuming that they were aware of one another, but did you learn about that at all? Yeah, I didn't. So I, I had the same question, you know, how, how integrated were, were those two lives that he, 
uh, or those two relationships that he had. And I didn't find the answer to that. So as you say, they they must have known about each other. And actually, no, I did I did see a reference to uh, when Caroline got married, that it may have been in reaction to his relationship with Martha Rudd. Mm. Um, but clearly she, you know, felt very strongly for Wilkie and ended up returning to him. So, you know, they must have figured out a way to make it work. Yeah. I, I thought it was really interesting that he used a different name, uh, when he was with Martha and he did when he was with Caroline. So, you know, really sort of compartmentalizing those lives. That is interesting. Yeah. I also learned that he always kept his money in his mother's bank account. I mean, certainly at some point in time, she passed away and that must have changed, but at least for a long time. And I was wondering to myself, is was that because, was it because of convenience? Was it because then that way he would just draw out the money it said that he needed for his household bills? Or was it so that he didn't have to worry about that conflict of how much money do I give to this woman? How much money do I, you know, my imagination was going strong when I heard that. So just another interesting layer to that, to that story and how he kept two households running. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't seen that. Yeah, just a little bit more about his, uh, you know, his lifestyle. Uh, I read that he was, um, you know, he really enjoyed eating. He really enjoyed drinking. So I imagine he was... Um, quite, as you say, quite a rock star and, and quite the life of the party mm -hmm. and must have been a very interesting person to um, to spend time with. Yes. I read that he was a really warm personality, really well liked by his friends, you know, somebody that you wanted to spend time with. And so definitely he seems like he would be just a good friend, a fun person to be with. And so that makes me wonder, just thinking about his fame, he was you know, so famous for a time. Why is it that he is, that's no longer the case for him, right? Um, that he's sort of lost that popularity. There, there are adaptations of The Women in White and Moonstone. Uh, so, you know, there was one of each of those, I think, in the early 2000s. And then more recently, um, BBC did um, uh, adapted both of them again. So certainly enduring stories. And, you know, the they really set precedent, I think, for um, the kinds of entertainment that that we enjoy now in terms of the mystery books that we read, whether it's a, a psychological thriller or detective mystery, right? Yeah. And I loved that um, they called it at the time the sensation novels. Uh, and I thought, you know, that's something we might call these days like the page turner. I imagine um, that I read The Moonstone and I know, Sarah, you read Woman in White. And both of them did have that feel where at the end of a chapter, I wouldn't necessarily call it a cliffhanger the way we discussed that, but it was that feeling of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? I definitely had that feeling. Uh, even though I will say that the prose was very dense compared to what we're used to these days, um, it did remind me of Dickens, the, the style as far as like sometimes you go off on a tangent, sometimes you get into pages and pages of description. Um, what, what was your opinion, Sarah? Did you get the feeling that that was a style of the time? Or do you think that he sort of had that similar style because they were friends and working together? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, and it, it's probably a little bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, he, I imagine that both Dickens and Collins kind of drew inspiration from each other in terms of um, their writing styles. But yeah, you definitely can place his writing in a particular period of time, in terms of what other what other works were um, were coming out, and I thought a little bit about this in relation to the serialization. Right, they I think it was I can't remember if it was sixteen or twenty parts that the Woman in White was uh, serialized over. So that's I mean it's a long it's a, it's a fairly long book. You know you kind of want to build your audience's interest because uh -huh. I think it was published weekly. And so, 
I can see why why it was written why it was written that way. I would be curious to know where those where those breaks were in terms of you know how much was published in each each issue of the of the magazine. Yes, but yeah, I I mean I I'm with you. With the prose is is pretty dense. <laughs> it's if you're not it, it's it's not at all like what what we currently yeah lots of description and and a, a fair amount of interjection what what actually one of the things that i thought was really interesting about the women in white is that it's actually told from multiple points of view mm-hmm. so at the beginning it, it it's explained that it's there are many people who observe the story so it's told at the beginning from the perspective of this art teacher who's sent to tutor some students and then the point of view changes as different people come into the story i couldn't think of any other examples of early writing that used multiple points of view did uh, i didn't read anything um of the moonstone did it use multiple points of view it does yeah it's it's the same idea um it's a little more compact in, in that it i can't recall exactly how many but maybe three or four so it rotates through the different points of view and i was a little disappointed because when I read the description of it, it said it was an epistolary novel. And you know, Sarah, that I'm a fan and then, and you write an epistolary series. So I was very excited about that, but I think that that was sort of an inappropriate sell. And I would not call it that. I would just say it's simply multiple points of view. Um, but I would agree with you. I, we haven't seen that before in these earlier works that we've discussed. So perhaps that's another one of his pioneering um, story devices. I mean, if he wasn't the first, he would he would have been amongst the first to use multiple narrators, right? Mm-hmm. I, I want to watch actually one of the adaptations. I didn't have a chance to do that, but it would be interesting to see kind of how visually some of these stories are told. I would definitely like to. I as as you said, I didn't have time to, but that's now that's kind of on my list of films to look for. I would really enjoy that. And, you know, you said earlier about why did he not stay at, as a popular literary figure and Charles Dickens did. And one thing that I read was that honestly, he didn't really go out on a high note. His work sort of became fell out of favor. It maybe wasn't as good in his later years and that's partially credited to his increasing use of opium. So he wasn't, he didn't go out on a high note, but they also, this podcast I listened to also referenced the fact that his later works had more and more and more dialogue scenes, pages and pages, and also um, kind of like just sitting indoors in a room having conversations. And they believe that that was partially because it made it easier for him to adapt those works into stage presentations. It was kind of like writing a script, but it made the novels less satisfying because your characters are in one place sitting in a room talking. So I wonder if that contributed to the fact that, you know, his public kind of lost interest in him and then he sort of fell out of favor and we just didn't remember him the way that we did some of his, uh, colleagues. I yeah, I did read that as he as his health declined, uh kind of so did his writing. Mm-hmm. I looked into to see if there was anything about how he wrote. And there actually was an essay that he wrote and it was written as if it was a letter and he was published towards the end of his life. He talks about how he starts first focusing on the story and then on the characters. Uh, And then he drafts without focusing on the details, but there are several stages of revision where those details are, are added in. And I thought that, I thought it was really interesting because the process to me didn't sound vastly different from how I think a lot of people write, right? You, you're kind of inspired by the idea and you build, build the story around that. Yeah. It seems like really accessible. I mean, that's a very inspiring, I think, for younger authors to like, you have this person who was very successful and revered and wrote some famous stories. And it's like, you really just have to go back to the basics. You get your story and you put in the characters and then you start layering in the details. I love it. I thought a lot about how the pressure or the timeline of having the serialized story must have impacted. So I did, I looked that up too and saw very similar 
information to what you did and that he did he was always plotting ahead because he had these weekly deadlines to meet and um the pressure would be real that seems like it would be a, a big feat. Totally. Yeah, I, it would be intense, I think, particularly if you know, I mean, I don't know how far ahead he was um, submitting his his work. I personally would probably have the thing written before, I, <laughs> before it was serialized because I would want to know that I had a conclusion, right? That was, that kind of made sense. But it sounds like maybe he didn't plan it out quite as quite as much. Yeah, it really seemed like they were writing and releasing. And so it's, I had the exact same thought, Sarah, like, oh my gosh, you're you're writing into the dark quite literally because would have this pressure. It's like those television series that we see and sometimes you're like, are they making this up week by week? Well, they quite certainly <laughs> might be because this is just how the pressure of something like that would be. So I don't think he had it done ahead of time, at least f for you know some of the work. I think he was writing it as he went and that that is very impressive to me. And I think that for a lot of people who write novel length works, they would never be able to produce a story like that. So we really have to give him his props for being able to pull that off. And Dickens and the other people who were doing, uh, Doyle certainly was working on that with the Sherlock Holmes. So it's very impressive. Yeah. As I was learning more about him, I was thinking I thought it would, it would force you, I think, to write well. Right. I mean, there would be a lot mm -hmm. of pressure. You kind of have to, you must be thinking about writing all the time, like thinking about the plot, even even if you're not physically putting words out on the, onto the page. You must have spent a lot of time just thinking about his stories so that when it came time to getting them out, it, you know, it went smoothly. Although he does, in that essay, he does talk about not being happy with what he's produced and then having to kind of start over. So uh, I, I don't remember now if the essay must have um, been talking more about works that he hadn't serialized because you just, I don't think, would have that time to kind of let something sit and, and reflect on it, right? Definitely. And he was doing all this while juggling two households. Let's not, let's not forget that very key yeah. point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And, and, and his fame, mm -hmm. attending dinners and, and, um, you know, I think he went on literary tours. I think he went to North America at least once on a tour to talk about his writing, which there were probably not a lot of authors who did that. Right. So, yeah, so this was a really interesting person to to learn more about, Brooke. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely going to check out uh, at least one of the screen adaptations of of his works. And, and uh, I'd love to compare notes after we've done that. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm so glad that we decided to research Wilkie Collins and to kind of round out these pioneers of the mystery genre. You see, definitely was a huge contributor. Absolutely. And I think it provides some really good context to kind of understand how the genre um, emerged and, and, and evolved. Um, and yeah, I feel like we've got a, we've kind of done a good I don't know, Mystery 101 <laughs> survey of, of the um, of the pioneers to the to the space. Exactly. Thanks for listening to the Clued in Mystery podcast. We'd love to hear what you think. You can reach us on Instagram at Clued in Mystery. Send us an email at hello at cluedinmystery.com and find out more at cluedinmystery.com. Please consider leaving a review or telling a friend. Thanks for joining us today on Clued in Mystery. I'm Brooke. And I'm Sarah. And we both love mystery. Clued in Mystery is produced by Brooke Peterson and Sarah M. Stephen. Music is by Shane Ivers at silvermansound.com. Visit us online at cluedinmystery.com or social media at Clued in Mystery. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, or telling your friends.